everybody. Uh, I am obviously safe uh, and am back from Kansas City. I'm going to give you a uh, two-minute uh, why I went and, and why, why this is important. Um, we have a, 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 a kind of a rare opportunity uh, in Vietnam right now because of some... Here's the thing. I'm going to back up just one second. If you are scared when you watch the news... You have no reason to be, because God is going to take every single thing that happens, he promises you this, every single thing that, he, that happens, and he is going to weave it into something that will accomplish his purpose. That does not mean that all of those things are, are particularly easy or comfortable when you're going through them. The problem is we uh, aren't able to see the, the weaving that God does until after the fact. Uh, right now in, in Vietnam, and here's a great example of that, there is, there is some unrest uh, in Southeast Asia. Perhaps you've heard a little bit about um, uh, China building islands. This is a very interesting concept, uh, is that there are, there are rules uh, how, how, what you can do with water, how far out you control it. Well, during the uh, 17th, 18th century, European powers would go out there and they'd find an island and they would say, hey, it's our island. You know, we found it. It's, it's, it's now mine. There was no reason for saying that. They just could. Well, well, China has kept that and has decided that, well, if I build an island, then I can cl claim that island. So there are a number of islands that are going up overnight. China's just building the islands. Uh, and there are several of them that are right off the coast of Vietnam. And so what happens, and, and they have uh, planes, United States planes, where three months ago there was no island, it was just water. Then it went to being an island, and now on one of them there's a five-story building. Well, China says, this is my five-story building, and we just claim this for China. Okay, and I'm not saying anything negative towards China at all. What I'm saying is, this is just what's happening. That's also something that really worries Vietnam. Well, Vietnam has taken the, the stance that we need to have somebody who is going to be at least somewhat um, predisposed to us in a positive way. Read the United States. Basically, that's what it wants. And what plays better in the United States than freedom? Freedom of the press and freedom of religion. So there is a, a man, his name is Boon Kio Lor, and he is down in, uh, in Kansas City, and he has been invited by the government of Vietnam. Uh, last year he went to Hanoi, and he preached and taught to the uh, communist officials for two days. Then they translated all of his Bible classes and all of his uh, sermons into Vietnamese, and they studied them for about six months. When they were done studying them, they gave him the official okay. Now they're asking him to go down to the south, Saigon, it used to be, now it's, it's called Ho Chi Minh City, and he is to do the same thing. The idea is uh, that if he has the official okay from the, the government there, then he will be able to train about 400 other uh, pastors. And then those pastors will go out because there is between, I'm always hesitant about numbers, but it's a lot. Uh, the number that I heard uh, this weekend kind of staggers my imagination, so I'm not going to give it to you <laughs> because it just seems to be a little bit too big. We'll just say tens of thousands, and, and that, would be, that would be pretty good. So the reason I went down there is that he needs to have uh, certain things happen here so that he can go uh, over to Vietnam uh, in order to be able to teach. Uh, and he was leaving, he leaves tomorrow. And so all of this stuff sort of came up and, and that's why I really could not wait. I would have rather have gone in November, uh, but that just did not work. So that's why I drove down. And Iowa is big, uh, but the thing is you don't have to worry about hitting a tree. No matter when you're driving... <laughs> It's, it's okay because you're not going to hit a tree. Uh, so anyway, that's why I went down there. It was a great visit. Then I worshipped with the Hmong congregation on Sunday morning, and then I, I drove back on Sunday and got back about midnight. So it was, it was all fine. 
Uh, the one thing different, uh, one thing different between China and, and Vietnam as far as outreach goes, uh, in Vietnam, once you are officially accepted, you can tell everybody that you are a Wells pastor. So Boon Kio, he goes wherever he goes. It's Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh City. Not quite yet, but I'm sure that'll be okay. Uh, he says, I am Boon Kio Lor. I am a Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod pastor. And they, they said the first few times I did it, they had to call the, the, you know, the party chiefs, and the party chiefs said, yep, he's just fine. So he said it's a little bit different. He's also working in the southern part of China, but he's working with very, very poor people. So it's not very much like our friends of China and, and Pastor Woody. Um, uh, China, you cannot say that. So that's the, the difference there. And I did talk to Pastor Woody this week. He sends you his greetings for those of you who know him. So there you go. That was my life last weekend. Uh, Pastor Diesler did a, a fine job. He got you... To, I would hope that he got you to the beginning of chapter 7. How far did he get you? Oh, look at that. All right, let's begin with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, as we gather to study your word once again, help us to recognize that your words are spirit and they are, they are truth. They provide life for us. Uh, help us to recognize that this word is, is not limited by what language it is expressed in. It is not limited in what culture uh, that it is proclaimed in. That uh, at the same moment throughout the world there are people speaking languages that none of us speak. And yet they know that they are sinners and they need a savior. And they know that you have sent your son to be their savior. Lord, help us to celebrate not only what happens here at Beautiful Savior... Not only what happens in the Wisconsin Senate, but what happens in the invisible Christian church. That wherever your word is preached, even if it is not in truth and purity, it will produce uh, the, the goals to which you have sent it. Lord, may we always be eager in our support of that word, our study of that word, and our sharing of that word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we can go through uh, chapter 7 just a wee bit faster because uh, this summer we did go through this um, in a Bible class. Uh, during the summer, for those of you who, who are not here, it's kind of a preacher's choice. One of the things that's really, really good about uh, doing the uh, Bible class series the way we do them during the year is that you know what's going to be done in... Uh, January. I mean, you, you, you look up that little list and you see Jan, 3rd January and you say, oh, we're going to be covering this. You know, starting next week, we're going to be going through a, a more of a video uh, series uh, about Martin Luther. You know that uh, in Jan, uh, December, uh, Pastor Diesler is going to be talking to you about uh, how does suffering uh, work when you are a Christian? How do, you, how do you merge these two things? That God is a God who is a good God. He loves his people. He makes promises to his people. And yet we as his people from time to time turn around and see tremendous suffering. Uh, how, how do you mesh those, those two things? The thing that makes it a little bit more difficult is then we're very bound to it. So during the summer, it's just preacher's choice, and that's why uh, this summer we had covered Romans chapter 7. Uh, and so this time I'm going to speed through it just a little bit faster. The, the main thing that I, I want you to get out of chapter 7 is kind of an overview, is the civil war that goes on in every Christian's life. There is part of you that is opposed to God and will always be opposed to God. Our sinful nature, my sinful nature, and I've said this before, but it is so profound, not because I said it, somebody else did, uh, Professor Deutschlander uh, said, you cannot kill it, you cannot convert it. No amount of my desire to stop the desire from sin, for sinning is ever going to stop that. You and I are going to have a part of us that is going to love to sin. The only question is how big or how small that is. If I am feeding, and that really is how he, uh, he ends uh, Romans chapter 7, which side is going to win in your life? Well, that depends upon where are you putting your effort, uh, what are you connected to? 
If I spend all of my time filling my mind up with things that are anti-spiritual, if I spend no time feeding my faith at all, my prayer life is uh, non-existent, my studying of His Word is non-existent, my corporate worship is non-existent, I don't take communion ever, what's going to happen is that this sinful nature in me, and uh, we're just going to call him the little guy, that little guy is going to be inside of you forever until you die and are resurrected. That little guy, you need to keep starving. You starve him by what you avoid. Uh, there are websites and movies and books and philosophies that are specifically designed to cause you to stumble and fall in your faith. And if you and I don't believe that, we have our proverbial heads in the sand. And they have one source, and that is the devil. And the devil's goal is to have those things be so attractive. Last week, Pastor Diesler did talk to you about what are the benefits of sins. You know, well, there aren't any. Why are we drawn to sin? There's a curiosity. There is that idea like, hey, maybe, maybe God is holding out for me. Uh, on me. Well, once we begin to sin and we tap into those sources, that little guy inside of us grows bigger and bigger and bigger and begins to dominate the way we think. We can never kill him. This is the bad news. And this is Paul's frustration. When you are reading through uh, Romans chapter 7, and we'll read through a, a section of it, you get the idea that this is a man who is struggling mightily because he says, I got this little guy inside of me. He is absolutely opposed to everything that God wants, and I'm trying to kill him, and that sucker won't die. I'm trying to drink him. He won't die. I am doing everything. That guy, it's like uh, Chucky in that... Uh, that oh. <laughs> Yes, the doll. You know, I should maybe use that as a, that could be a sermon sometime. We can. <laughs> you know, if we really wanted to be uh, uh, very creative, we could have um, Vicar Poston dressed up as Chucky. And he could <laughs> run. <laughs> he, could <laughs> he could run through the church. I am telling you, it could work. <laughs> Um, I will, uh, I'll bounce that off Pastor Coulter, John, before we do it. <laughs> I, now back to the serious part, you know, that, but that's exactly what it is. There's a tyranny that comes from, from that little Chucky that's inside of us. You can't kill him. This is my most profound frustration with being me. It's not working, it's not uh, seeing a, a world where I, I'm frustrated because I can't figure out why people just can't be civil to one another. I don't know what happened to civility. I don't know what happened to kindness. I don't know what happened to having a, a dialogue where people use words and they treat other people with respect. That irks me. What frustrates me uh, what oppresses me is that inside of me, I can't kill uh, my sinful nature. I, 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 it's a constant battle. It's going to be one that you are going to be in every day. Uh, when I was younger, I used to kind of think that when I was going to die and, and go to heaven, that the greatest thing would be I would never get sick and, and there, were, there was no more Latin because uh, I took <laughs> Latin and I just thought... I just thought Latin was dumb, and, and, and now I'm 52, and I think Latin is dumb. Uh, but not as dumb, and you know why it's not as dumb? Because I'm not forced to learn it any longer. So we've come to some kind of, uh, uh, oh, a modus vivendi. There's some Latin for you, some kind of way that we can live together. I get older, and, and I, I long for heaven because I long for the battle to be over. Not just the, the, the battle... Uh, uh, in this world, not a, a battle with a body that gets sick and, and ultimately will betray me, but that battle of saying, Lord, I want to give you everything. I want to give you all of my mind. I want to give you all, everything you want, God. I want to give to you. 
And then I go, addendum. I will give you everything but. Here is, here is the struggle of a Christian. What are you not giving him? Lord, you can have it all, but I want to keep this. You, Lord, Lord, here is my money, here is my time, but don't ask me to forgive this person. Or Lord, I will forgive and I will do this, this, and this, but um, Lord, don't ask for my money. Or whatever it is, each person will struggle with something separate. I do, I know you do, Paul does. Let's take a look at some of his frustration. Um, uh, in verse 1, how may Paul have been a little sarcastic in what he said? Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over a man only as long as he lives? Uh, why might this be a little bit sarcastic? Who do you think he's talking to here? Well, remember the congregation. It's made up of two groups. Remember those two groups? Yeah, Jews, yeah. He's talking to the, to the Jews. He's talking to those uh, who, who had the law. And so what he's saying is, brothers, don't you know? For you know the law. I mean, you, you know the law already. Uh, Paul does, I think sometimes people have tried to explain away some of Paul's language by saying it really wasn't sarcastic. I don't know about that. I read Galatians. I just Oh, you're going to use Galatians, aren't you? Yeah, uh, Vicar Paustian will be doing a Bible class on Galatians. There are just times that I read it and I just say there can be nothing else here but sarcasm. Uh, real quickly, just so you not important, but so you get the idea. Sar sarcasm comes from a Greek word, sarkazomai. It means to cut. So sarcasm, it's a cutting kind of humor. That's where it comes from. Uh, it's, it's etymology. Uh, Paul's illustration is um, marriage. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So then if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. Uh, don't, don't get lost in the illustration here. Paul's not really making any rules about marriage, uh, although those rules are, are accurate, obviously. What he's saying is, this is kind of like this. That's how an analogy works. An analogy is like, okay, I'm not really getting this idea. I don't really know what this means. But I do understand how this works. And if I understand how this works, then I can understand how this works over here. Uh, if you look at verse 4 to 6, uh, we see how Paul applies the concept. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you may, might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit to God. For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in a new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Okay, now you take a look at those verses. Tell me what comparison he makes. Okay, uh, he talks about dying, talks about being married and dying, and then he says, okay, now it's also like you have been married and you've also died. Uh, what was, in the, in the second comparison, what were we originally married to? Please. Sin. Yeah, married to sin. And how did we become, um, how do we recognize that we were sinful? Well, what's the only way you can recognize you're sinful? The law. The law. See, originally that's what he says. He says, you know, uh, the, the, first, the, the first bride, uh, husband, oh, I don't know, <laughs> spouse. The first spouse in this case was the law. But you've now 
died to the law. Remember back in chapter 6, he talks about the, the death that we had and then the, the, the burial and the resurrection. Uh, why can Christians say that they have died to the law? I want you to think about that. Why is it possible for me to say the law is important? The law has to be used. Uh, why can I say then I have died to that law? Please, Ken. We are not bound to the law. Uh, the law is not the law that is going to save me or can save me. Um, uh, when were we controlled by the sinful nature then? And you and Paul going on here, we're just going to kind of work through those verses. When were we controlled? And what I mean controlled, I mean is absolutely controlled. Well, before you came to faith, when am I controlled? Today, anytime I sin. Okay, that, that's really the point. Anytime that I sin, that is when I am controlled by the law. The difference is, and there's a big difference, before faith, I can only be controlled by sin. That's the only thing that can happen. Uh, after I have come to faith, I have tapped into the power that God gives to me through His Holy Spirit. If I have this power through the Holy Spirit, I am now dead to the law, and now I have the possibility of fighting off any individual uh, temptation for the right reason. Now, does that mean that somebody who is not a believer cannot fight off temptation? No. It is not, you can go to the methadone clinic and you're going to find believers and unbelievers. What's the difference, though, between somebody who is fighting off a temptation, and I'll use the word for, for both sets of people. How is an unbeliever fighting off temptation very different than the way a believer fights off temptation? I'll give you about a minute to think about that. Ready, go. All right, 43 seconds later, somebody give me a good answer. Please, Barry. Good, good. This is, it's not a matter of right and wrong. It's a matter, matter of being beneficial um, or negative. Uh, again, please uh, don't... Uh, uh, underestimate uh, people who, who are not connected to Jesus through faith. I prefer to use that. I know it's more wordy than saying an unbeliever. I do think, though, that unbeliever kind of, it, it, it's true. I, I get that. I do think it's maybe a little bit harsher. I think unbeliever doesn't, doesn't always reflect the, the potentiality that everybody has to be a, a, a believer. I think the other thing is, who has Jesus died for? We covered that in Romans. Every single person who has ever been conceived, every single person who will ever be conceived, not born, been conceived. Uh, Jesus died for the whole, once for all. So those who are not connected to Jesus in faith, I know it's more wordy, but I, I think it's more accurate. I think it's also more loving. So that's the, that's the way I'm going to go. People who are not connected to Jesus through faith um, still have natural knowledge and still have that, that feeling of conscience. Yeah, this isn't so good. 
Uh, this is probably good. That's there, but mostly it's done from the, from the uh, uh, test, the litmus test of saying, this is good for self, this is not good for self. Heroin addiction, not good for self. Losing job, not good for self. Got to get over that, heading to the methadone clinic. Well, that's different from a believer. A, a, a believer will say, yes, it's bad for self, but also because, hey, my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Not only is this bad for my body, but this is bad for my relationship with my Savior. And that really is the thing that I, um, I would encourage all of us uh, to think through. It's not so much what is beneficial for me personally, what is beneficial for me in my relationship with my Savior? I was just going to agree with what you were saying about uh, an unbeliever. It's sort of like the difference between saying somebody is ignorant and somebody is stupid. Ignorant just means they're not educated. And an unbeliever to me means a total rejection. Where, where yeah. you, what you're saying is there may be people who don't believe, but that's because they don't know Yep, they have not come, come in contact with the means of grace. This is the difficult thing. Uh, once somebody is in church, that, that, that's awesome. And, and in many ways, don't reduce my argument to an absurd level, in many ways, my work is somewhat done by the time somebody gets into church. Somebody gets into church and uh, we have, today we'll, we'll be saying the psalm uh, responsively. Uh, there is a reading from Romans, there's a reading from Matthew, uh, all of those things, that's the word. And there is prayer, that's the means of grace. When somebody is in the presence of the means of grace, that means of grace is going to work. God promises it will. The, the difficulty, though, is getting somebody to a place where they can hear the means of grace. That's the part that's the uh, the struggle or the, the difficulty or the art or whatever. There's a, a lady in our congregation. I'm not going to call her out by name. Uh, and you probably, if I told you who it is, you go, I wouldn't have thought so. She is brilliant about getting people to come to church. In fact, I know two people. I don't know how she does it. But she's just so upfront. And it's like, I'll look over there and i say, who was that with you? Oh, that's my friend. I invited them. Have they ever been to church? Nope. Never been to church. Uh, the, the, the other one, just people always bringing people. Just always people. She has that gift. She said, I don't know how well I would explain it. She said, but all I know is that if they come to church, they're going to hear God's word. And for whatever reason, people just say yes to her. Well, both of them. I, I just don't know how they, I wish I could do that that well. I look at, but I'm not a woman, so I, I don't know if that's maybe part of it. Uh, but she is just, just uh, both of them. Yep, they are, they are great assets here. If that's your gift, great, use it. Maybe that's not your gift, find another one. <laughs> use it, uh, as the case may be. But yeah, once they're here, then the means of grace operate. Uh, I want to give you something. I think it's important. Verse 5. I'm going to do a little Greek work with you just because I think it's going to help a different passage. For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, sinful flesh, I think, is the new translation. Uh, that word is sarks. I'm going to give you one unimportant thing, but I'll do it real fast. And then I'll give you something that is more, much, much more important. Sarks. Um, when the, when the Greeks first went to uh, Egypt and they, they looked inside the, you know, the coffins and stuff like that and then the uh, Romans and so forth, they couldn't figure out what those you know, coffin things were called. So they would open them up and they would see that the bodies were like all decayed and stuff. So they called them body eaters. Sarcophagus. Sark's flesh. Esophagus you know, related to eaters. So you say, I don't know what it is, but that eats flesh. So I know it sounds kind of, you know, nice. It's like a sarcophagus. All it means is flesh eater. Okay, 
that was not as important as this. Uh, this is also the verse that is, or the word that's used in Romans 8, 7. Okay, and, I, and I'm going to tie these all together. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. When we are talking about our sinful nature, I'm just going to use the word sarks there. When we're talking about that sarks, one, sarks is not an activity. Okay, Sin, our sinful nature, original sin, I don't do original sin. That's the, the root that causes all kinds of other problems. Uh, whatever sin you struggle with, mm, bitterness, worry, uh, greed, anger, violence, that's just the flower of the sin. The root is the sinful nature. So when we're talking about our sinful nature, I can't do that. It is the soil out of which all of the other things grow. The second part about it, and I think is so important, is it's hostile to God. What do you understand by the word hostile? When I say hostile. Opposed yeah, opposed in every way. When there is hostility, there, there's, no, there's no meeting. Okay, no, there's really no resolution. Uh, anger, you can be angry with somebody and then, you know, you find out later on that maybe the Chucky reference wasn't very good and, and uh, Vicar Paustian used to have nightmares about it and he is angry with me for the last 35 minutes and we sit down in my office on Monday as we go through some things together and he goes, you know, Pastor Elon, I was angry because I was scared of Chucky when I was growing up. Well, I would say, Vicar Paustian, I am legitimately sorry. Sorry about that. I won't do that ever again. No, no Chucky references. How are you with Saw? Uh, and and we, just kind of, we just kind of move on. The anger is resolved. I, I think when the word hostility is used, you come to one of those situations where there's, there's no meeting. I, I would use probably uh, the Middle East is a pretty good example uh, of that, and, and maybe we'll just use the Temple Mount, you know, that you have people, you know, the, the people who want the Jews and the, we'll say Muslims, it's not wholly accurate, but the Jews and the Muslims on the Temple Mount. There is no solution. I am convinced of that. There will not be a solution. Okay, that's the hostility. It's not that I don't, and here's the key, it's not that I don't submit to God. I can't submit to God according to my sinful nature. It's not that this sarksness in me, all it needs is a good whack. You know, if, if I'm punished enough, then one of these days my sinful nature is going to go, okay, I'm all in. All in with God. I take a look at the way I've been living and thinking. Um, I'm done with that. I'm I'm moving on. It does not submit. It cannot submit. Once again, you go back to the opening statements. Isn't that the frustration? You can tell yourself over and over and over again, I'm only speaking here of your sinful nature. Okay, remember, you are freed from the law now. Your sinful nature need not control you any longer. It's going to be part of you, but it is no longer the dominant part of you. Unfortunately, right now, we're talking about Romans chapter 7, and Romans chapter 7 is dwelling on the, on the battle. Uh, we will end by taking a look at Romans chapter 8, verse 1, just so that we end on a high note, because I don't want you to have a whole year of going, I'm battling with this sinful nature, and there's no hope. Uh, here's the other thing I think that's important about that verse. If somebody could go to John chapter 3, verse 6, and just take a look at that. Uh, it, it, it always interests me, when a translator makes a, a certain choice and says, okay, we're going to use uh, a word here and translate it one way and then use the same word someplace else and translate it some, somewhere, some way different. Uh, somebody want to read uh, John chapter 3, verse 6? Please, Mr. Hillard. Flesh gives birth to flesh. 
Flesh. Okay, you can stop there. Flesh gives birth to flesh. That's the word sarx. See, that's important. Flesh gives birth. What, what's he saying there? He's saying my sinful nature will give birth to my sinful nature to other people who have sinful nature. Flesh gives birth to flesh. That's not a, that's not a reference to humanity giving birth to humanity. Okay, that's why you take all of those three passages. This is also very important, uh, I think, when we talk about the doctrine of the virgin birth. I, I know sometimes, I, I visited with somebody this last year about that, um, who said, you know, that there are some things that separate one group from another, and they're really not that big a deal. And one of the things that he said is, you know, finally in the end, uh, you know, if there's a virgin birth or if there's not a virgin birth, you know, what's, what's the, the difference? And I said, w well, <laughs> um, kind of a big one. <laughs> and, and where is that? And that's from John 3, 6. Flesh gives birth to flesh. If Jesus Christ has a human mother and a human father, flesh gives birth to flesh. That's not, once again, that's not humanity giving birth to humanity. That is Sark's giving birth to Sark's. Now you go back to Romans and you see what that sarksness is. The sinful flesh, the sarks, is hostile to God. It does not submit to him. It cannot submit to him. Okay? Just, uh, I think that that is, that is worth just noting there, uh, that connection. Okay, um... Why now, uh, verse 6, are we, why is it possible for us to fight our natural tendencies to rebel? Give me some reasons why now that you and I have died to the law, why are we able to fight our natural tendencies? Sounds like I'm on a bummer right now. It's like, yeah, Jamie, you are going to fight and you are going to lose every day of your life. You know, why not throw in the white towel? Well, give me some things that would indicate that, that we are able to fight and ultimately triumph. Please. And I will, uh, one word there, motivation. What's my motivation? I have been, you know who you are? You are holy. That is what you are. You have been declared holy. You have been justified. We talked about that enough. That, that is the gavel. It's a forensic act, which just means it comes from a court law. All charges dropped. What does God hold against you? Not one thing. Do you feel the power to be able to say no to sin now? No, I am absolutely holy. I am perfect in every respect. Now I can go out and say, I, I am going to keep myself pure. And you, little guy, shut it. I'm not listening to you. I don't have to listen to you. You will not dominate me. Um, anybody else? Why are we able to, uh, to fight a, uh, the good fight and end up victorious? Please. Well, God's word also promises that he will never leave us or forsake us. He's always with us. You know what? Point number two right there, Tom. We are not alone. Yeah, not alone. You, you are not fighting that battle by yourself. You're not standing there alone. Uh, I always thought that, you know, I, I wonder if uh, Adam and Eve, uh, I think if I was in the garden, I probably would not have eaten the fruit. Because I've, I've read that story a lot. But you know what would have happened? The very next temptation I would have fallen into. Have you ever done that where you say, like, if I would have been there, there's just no way I'd have eaten that talking snake. Ah, that's, I wouldn't be so naive. Okay, maybe not. But I would have given you, me about another 12 seconds. And then it would have been the talking giraffe or, or I don't know what. Yeah, but what was the problem? The problem was 
Eve is there. Adam is right next to her. You know, this is the, the, the Hebrew is very clear. Imadi, right next. I mean, this isn't like Adam's in the back 40 and he can't tell what's going on. The, the, the Hebrew makes it sound, I think, that, that they're, they're pretty close. There's a conversation between Eve and the serpent and then between Eve and Adam. But who wasn't? Who was not part of the conversation? God. Yeah. When I fall into sin, it's because God is not part of the conversation. Not God saying, don't do this. Okay? Although he does say that. But you are different. You are mine. You are holy. I will tell you what I, I think is the, ab, for me, this is, I don't know how it works for you. Absolutely the, the thing that helps me the most when I don't sin and the thing that I forget when I do sin is when I sin, I have forgotten my holiness. And then I start, you know, this bargaining. Well, it's not so bad. I probably won't do it. Well, I, I shouldn't do it. I might do it. I don't really want to have this conversation anymore. I'm just going to do it. Okay. Uh, but when I approach it, the way Paul says is a temptation comes my way and I'm going, you know what? I am holy. I do not need to do this to be fulfilled. I do not need to do this to, to, um, uh, to be happy. I do not need this to do this to please somebody else. God has declared me holy. That's enough. Uh, as Tom said, you know, we approach it from the standpoint of not, uh, we're not alone. And finally, who dwells in your heart? The Holy Spirit. What do you have in your heart? If you, if you can say right now, Jesus is Lord, I know something about you. You should know something about you. If you can say, Jesus is Lord, the Holy Spirit is in your heart. If the Holy Spirit is in your heart, you have tapped into all of the power that is His. Um, um, what does Paul mean by saying we have been released by the law? Does that mean no more law? That means you can live and do whatever you want. I got good news from you. You leave here, boy, and it is just one 24-hour period of partying. How have you been released? Please. You and I no longer need the, the law to be saved. You know, and, and unfortunately, and this is, this is not a, a small point, the chief purpose of the law is not to show us how to live. The sh chief purpose of the law is not as a, as a guide. The chief purpose of the law is a mirror. I need to know I got a problem. When I look in that mirror, uh, I think it was two weeks ago I, I used the image of the mirror. That's the chief purpose of the law. It's not to show me, okay, now, you know, it's a curb. Okay, don't do this. That's a purpose. It's not a guideline. Okay, how can a young man keep his way pure by living according to your word? That's not the chief purpose. The chief purpose is to drive me to the point where I understand I have only one hope. That hope is in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ will not disappoint. One more time. Uh, I have only one hope. That hope is in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ will not disappoint. All right, please. Yes, of course. Yes. I would. I would think that he's referring 
misuse of the law. Okay, so I definitely the, the, the Ten Commandments. You know, definitely the Ten Commandments. I, I would think that it might be a little bit broader than this just because by this time, you know, Jesus over and over and over again makes reference to the misuse of the law. You say, well, you have this law, you know, the ox falls into the, you know, the pit. You will gladly dig the, the ox out of the pit, but if, you know, some poor sucker falls in the pit, you know, and it's not worth anything to you. So I would think that I would not narrow it down to just the Ten Commandments. Of course it's there, but any thought that by what I do, I can make myself acceptable to God. I can earn his approval. All right. Any other questions? We're kind of rounding down a little bit here. Um, I want to go down, wait to the end. Then what I'll do is I will, I will condense this. We'll have a little bit more of a, uh, a review, a little healthier review when we pick this up next year in, uh, in September. September's over already. Who knew? Uh, go to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. You know, you see the struggling with sin. We have adequately talked about the, the struggle with sin, so forth, uh, the civil war that goes on. And here, here's where I, it's very useful to have chapters and verses because then it's just easy to find. Just so you understand, this did not come from the Holy Spirit. It wasn't like Paul said, okay, chapter 7 done, chapter 8, verse 1. This is done by a guy named, uh, he was the Bishop of Usher in um, uh, Ireland. Here's where it, it doesn't really work, is I think that you get to the end, uh, you know, and Paul's going, the, the evil I don't want to do, I do. The, the, the good that I want to do, I don't do. Who will save me from this body of death? Uh, so then I, I myself, last verse of chapter 7, so then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, done. That's the end of our meditation. That break is not there. When he goes back and forth, who will save me from this body of death? Romans chapter 8, verse 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What's the capstone to the struggle? Your struggle is temporary and your struggle will not rob you of salvation. Your sin does not remove your holiness. Your struggle does not mean that you are no longer a Christian. Your struggle is a sign that you are a Christian. I think one of the, the healthier things then to approach this is embrace your struggle. Embrace your failure. Embrace it because you know that higher than you, God has already looked at you and declared you righteous for the sake of his son Jesus. There is no condemnation. And that's stronger than the word judgment. In judgment, it's just one little word. Uh, and when Greek wants to make a point, it just takes a lot of words and kind of like mushes them together. This is not the word for judgment. This is the word for condemnation. Uh, there is no condemnation. There is no judgment. There are no ill feelings. There is no negativity that God has for you ever. Ever. In the middle of your sin? Ever. In the middle of your failure? Ever. Never. Once you operate from that, this is where I'm at. I have been declared holy. That's going to give us the strength to get back in the fray and say, not this time, not this time, last time, okay, well, the last 400 times, but not this time because I'm different. I'm holy. All right. Uh, we'll conclude uh, with a prayer since we're done with this. Dear Father in heaven, help us to recognize that while this battle is going on constantly inside of us, inside of me, yet in the end there is only one uh, possible outcome, and that is that you have declared us, uh, all people, justified through the death and resurrection of your Son. Lord, help me to dwell on the fact that I am holy. 
I don't mean dwell on the fact that I am holy so that now I can start fighting off temptation, but to take a few minutes today and just reflect on the fact that I am in your sight pure. In fact, I am every bit as pure as your son. Once I have dwelt and marinated in that grace, then, Lord, lead me to go out and, and once again take up that noble fight, not because I want to earn your approval, but because you have loved me and you have declared me your child. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, we're going to see how this goes. I think we're going to be meeting in church if you are going to be coming to the Luther Bible study. Um, we'll see how that goes. Lord's blessings to all of you. Thank you.